If it's worth worrying about, then it's worth praying about. You mean I can pray about, I don't have money to pay for my kids' braces? Yes, you can pray about that. I, 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 my face is broken out. Can I pray about that? You can pray about that. My back is out. You can pray about that. There, there is nothing too small. or too, There are no big requests to God, and there are no small requests to God. God says you can pray about anything. This week, I saw posted uh, on uh, my Facebook site uh, this note. Nothing in my life seems to be working right now. I'm lonely, I'm broke, I'm out of work, I'm a minority, and every door I knock on seems to close before me. Pastor Rick, I feel like I've been headed down a blind alley and I've reached a dead end in my work and with my girlfriend. Can you help me? Does God even care? I really need a breakthrough. It was that last phrase that caught my attention and actually helped me decide what I was going to teach on this weekend. I really need a breakthrough. Now, what is a breakthrough? Well, according to the dictionary, a breakthrough is a sudden, dramatic, and, um, and important advance. A sudden, dramatic, and important advance. Science has breakthroughs. Technology has breakthroughs. Medicine has breakthroughs, an important, sudden, dramatic, important advance. Um, diplomacy, as I said, has, has breakthroughs. You can have a breakthrough in your marriage. You can have a breakthrough in, in a relationship. You can have a breakthrough in your career. Now, the opposite of a breakthrough is a setback. And if you're not moving forward, then you are either stalled and, and that could be the opposite of a breakthrough. You're, you're at an impasse, you're at a dead end, you're at a deadlock, you're stalemated. Uh, you, you say, I'm, I'm not making any progress in my life. I'm not making any progress in my marriage. I'm not making any progress in my career. I need a breakthrough. Or you could have had a, a setback. And, and you say, I, 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 need, I need to move forward. Now, we can have personal and spiritual breakthroughs too. I've had many in my life. I've had moments of clarity in my life when um, uh, all of a sudden I go, aha, and it, it, God worked in my life and I took a whole new direction. I remember the very first one uh, as a teenager working as a lifeguard at a Christian camp when my life was headed this direction and all of a sudden it took a whole new direction in life because I had that breakthrough moment, that moment of clarity. Now, I don't know if you figured this out or not, but God often uses pain to get our attention. C.S. Lewis said, God whispers to us in our pleasure, but he, he shouts to us in our, plane. He's, in our pain. He's going, hello, do you think I just made you to live for yourself, huh? You think that the whole purpose of your life is for you to just live for you? No, 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 you're made for so much more. And, and God often uses pain to get our attention, and God often uses pain to prepare us for a breakthrough. So if you're in pain right now, congratulations. You may be getting ready for a breakthrough. And the Bible says this in Proverbs 20, verse 30. Sometimes it takes a painful experience to make us change our ways. Anybody agree with that? Yeah, we, we've all had experiences with that. Uh, we don't change when we see the light, we change when we feel the heat. And when things get bad enough, you never change in life until the fear of change is exceeded by your pain. And when your pain gets worse than your fear, then you change. That's human behavior. And so God often allows upsets and shakeups and pain in our lives. Uh, I mean, you may be getting ready for a breakthrough right now because you're going through a period of confusion. And you go, I don't have the foggiest idea what I'm supposed to do next with my life. I, I don't even know. And I'm just kind of in a, in a ball of confusion. I don't, I don't know what to do. Or you may be feeling overwhelmed and you think, uh, there's just too much to get done, and I can't get it all done. And uh, I, I'm overwhelmed by life. Some of you probably feel that way, o overwhelmed by life. You need a breakthrough. Uh, some of you maybe feel outnumbered. You say, I, I feel like I'm in the minority here, and I feel like the majority's coming against me, and I, I don't like this, and I, I'm outnumbered, and I need a breakthrough. Or you may be thinking, I, I'm under-resourced. I don't have the money I need to do what I need to do with my life. I don't have the funds. I don't have 
uh, the resources. And, and so I, I need a financial breakthrough. Now, when I talk about this, I, I want you to ask yourself, where do I need a breakthrough? Some of you uh, need a breakthrough with your health. It, it's not good. And you've been struggling with it. And you need a physical or health breakthrough with your life. Some of you need a breakthrough in your finances. Uh, the, the truth is, you're not making it. And, and you're going the wrong way. And you're going deeper and deeper in death. And you go, I, I need a financial breakthrough. Some of you need a relationship breakthrough. Your, your marriage or your friendship or your boyfriend or your girlfriend, you're at an impasse. And you're deadlocked. And, and, and you're at a stalemate. And it's not moving forward. And it's just kind of stuck. Um, you may need a breakthrough at school. You may need a breakthrough at work. You may need a new idea, a breakthrough idea for, for your business. Um, you may need a breakthrough with your kids. And you go, you know, it's just not working. They're, they're heading the wrong direction. I can see it. You may need a breakthrough with God. Now, I have been in ministry for about 45 years. And what I've learned is that breakthroughs happen generally when you seek them. They don't just happen spontaneously. You get a breakthrough in your life when you seek a breakthrough. I've talked to hundreds of thousands of people who were stuck in certain positions, and in order to get to that breakthrough, they had to do some certain things to actually seek it. I've discovered that breakthroughs typically happen when you seek them. The Bible says in, in Psalm 72, verse two, when I was in distress, that's pain, I sought the Lord. I'm seeking a breakthrough. And every night, I stretched out my hands to him in prayer. I'm going to teach you how to do that this weekend, how to seek the Lord, how to stretch out your hands in prayer to him when you're in pain, when you're in distress, when you're in confusion, when you're overwhelmed, outnumbered, or under-resourced. And we're actually going to start with a day of fasting. Uh, where you go without food for a day. Because in the Bible, that's often a sign to God that you're serious about not staying in the condition uh, that you're in. Now, I don't want you to miss this. I, I don't want you to miss the breakthrough that God has planned for you. So this weekend, we're going to look at, if you'll take out your, your message notes, praying and fasting for a breakthrough. Praying and fasting for a breakthrough. Now, I want to tell you that if you're listening to this right now, this is not an accident. I've been praying for this message for some time, and I ask God to bring just the right people here. So if you are here hearing me talk about this, I take it pretty seriously that God wants to do a breakthrough in your life. There are a lot of people who won't hear this message because maybe they don't need it. But if you're here, it means God wants to do something special in your life, and I, I want you to experience the breakthrough. Now in the Bible, any time... Anybody uh, needed any kind of breakthrough, physical, financial, relational, emotional, needed a breakthrough, they always would seek God through prayer and fasting. Always. And I'm going to give you just a couple examples. I could give you hundreds of these. I'm going to give you an example of two kings. Uh, the first one is David. David's probably the most famous king in the Bible. Uh, he was king of Israel at its you know, pinnacle of power. He had united all of the, the 12 tribes together. And yet, he had a great thing going. And always, after something good happens, there is always a downside to it. With every mountaintop, there's a valley. After every victory, there's a test. And we looked at Daniel. We saw all of those tests. He'd have a promotion, get another test. Promotion, get another test. And on and on. David had just got elected, chosen king of Israel. This is a big deal. The moment he gets chosen as king, all hell breaks loose. And that often happens in your life. When something really good happens, you get a promotion or something, right after that, uh, somebody doesn't like it and it starts to, to crumble. So let me show you this first example. First Chronicles chapter 14 says this. Uh, when the Philistines learned that David had been made king of Israel, now the Philistines are the enemy, and they've got a big, big army, bigger than Israel's. Uh, they mobilized all of their forces against him, against David, to attack and enslave him. Now, you may have felt this in your life. You maybe felt like the, the, the forces were mobilizing against you and that you're under attack and that something or someone or some habit is trying to enslave you. 
And so he's being mobilized, they're being mobilized to, to come against David. But David heard the news and he moved to his fortified place. Now that's a good thing. You ought to, ha you ought to have a, a, a fortified place. Do you have one? When you're under attack, when times are tough, when you don't know which way to turn, when you feel like everything's against you, what's your fortified place? This is your fortified place. Our church family is a fortified place. We will pray for you. We will back you up. We will support you. We will be there. That's what small groups are all about. A small group is a fortified place. If you don't have a fortified place when the enemy comes after you, you're going to get killed. And so David pulls back to his fortified place. The church, the family of God, is a fortified place. Now it says this. Then... Uh, the Philistine army moved in and spread out across the entire valley. So they're pretty much encircling him. They're trying to get him so he has no escape. So what does David do? So David sought the Lord in prayer. We're going to seek the Lord in prayer for a breakthrough in your life. And not only are you going to be praying for your life, as a church family, we're going to pray for each other can you imagine how your life might be different if you have thousands of brothers and sisters in this family praying for you? And so it says there, let's go back. Uh, so David sought the Lord in prayer. And he asked, uh, should I go fight these Philistines? Uh, will you give them over to me? Now here's an important lesson of life. Never fight a battle without asking God first. A legal battle, a financial battle, a relational battle, a battle at work, never, ever fight a battle without asking God first. If you don't ask God, you're on your own. Good luck. But if you do what David did, he sought the Lord in prayer and said, should I even make an issue of this at work? Should I make an issue of this with my wife, with my husband? Should I never fight a battle without asking God first? And he'll tell you. Now it says, here's what God said. Uh, the Lord replied, yes, go ahead. You can certainly count on me to give you the victory. So David went out and he defeated them. He defeats the enemy. And then David said, this is great, I watched the Lord break through. I watched the Lord break through my enemies like a mighty flood. So he named the place the Lord broke through. That's what I want to happen in your life. I want you to name a place the Lord broke through. My finances, the Lord broke through. My impasse in this relationship, the Lord broke through. My schooling, the Lord broke through. You need a breakthrough in your life. But you gotta do the things that David did. Now, let me give you a second example. This is another king in Israel. He's got a more weird name. He's not named David, his name is Jehoshaphat. How'd you like to be named that? Jehoshaphat. And this guy is, over, is facing overwhelming opposition too. In fact, he's just had a spiritual revival in his nation. Everything's going great. And then all it says, it says that three enemy nations um, came against this king, Jehoshaphat. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, it says this. Uh, after this, after what? After they'd had this big spiritual victory. You can always count on it. When things are going good, behind every mountaintop is a valley. After this, all the good things that happened in chapter 19, three enemies joined forces against Judah. That's another name for the northern part of Israel. And their enemies, the Bible actually tells us it was the Ammonites, uh, the Moabites, and the Minuites. Now, they may have had the Stalactites and Stalagmites and the Outosites and the Uptites, but I don't know. I do know that there were at least three that were there coming against him. And so he's, he's, he's clearly out outmanned, outmaneuvered, outnumbered. And maybe you felt like that in life. He says, after this, the enemies joined forces against Judah, and some men told the king, a vast army is coming against you. Now, that's a reason to worry. And it says, alarmed and afraid, that's a natural first reaction when you are under attack. Alarmed and afraid, King Jehoshaphat resolved to seek the Lord. Now, we're gonna come back to this, but notice, he doesn't stay afraid. Instead, he switches from being focused on his worries to focusing on the Lord. It's a resolution. It's a choice. And I'm going to teach you how to do this, how you can break the habit of worry in your life. 
Alarmed and afraid, he doesn't stay focused on what he doesn't like. He immediately switches his mind to seek the Lord. He takes his vision off the bad things and he puts his vision on God. All right? And then it says this. He resolved to seek the Lord. Then he proclaimed a fast for everyone. Why? Because a fast says, God, we're serious about this. You got our attention. It's just a way of saying we're serious. We mean business on this prayer. So all of the people came together, they came together to seek help from the Lord, and they came from everywhere to seek God. Now, this guy, Jehoshaphat, does four things right, and it's the four things you gotta do if you wanna have a breakthrough in your life, in any area, relational, physical, mental, spiritual, whatever. First thing, instead of worrying, uh, he refocuses on God. A second, it says he resolved, that means he made a choice, to say, I'm going to focus and seek God. I'm going to find out what God wants me to do with my life. I want to know God's will. He resolved to seek the Lord. Third, uh, he fasted. He actually called for a national fast because the whole nation was under attack. So the whole nation said, we're going to go without food. It's saying, God, we're serious about this. We mean business. We, we want your input on this. And then it says, all of the people uh, joined together to seek God through prayer. And the result was, a miraculous victory. I'm not gonna tell you the whole story. You can go read 2 Chronicles 20. It's one of my favorite stories. But the bottom line is when these three enemy armies came together, God says, you won't have to fight in this battle. Just watch. I'm gonna confuse them. And he confuses the three enemies. They start fighting each other. They kill each other off. They all die. And Israel walks into the valley and they get to pick up all the spoils of war. It took them about three days to take off all the spoils of war. And so they named the place the Valley of Blessing. What had been a valley of battle became a valley of blessing. Now, in your life, you got some battles going on, maybe with your parents, maybe with your spouse, maybe with a child, maybe with somebody at work. God wants to turn the valley of battles into a valley of blessing. But the key is to do the four things that Jehoshaphat did and that David did. And they say, well, how about me? How, how do I do that? How do I do these same four things that these two kings did long ago? Well, Paul tells us how to do it in the book of Philippians. And in Philippians chapter four, verses six to eight, um, Paul says, under the inspiration of God, there are four things you need to do if you're gonna have a breakthrough. Let me read you that passage, okay? Here's what Philippians four, six to eight says. Don't worry about anything. <laughs> But pray instead in everything, by prayer and petition, in, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So he says, don't worry, but instead he's saying pray. And he says, you do it with thanksgiving. And he says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What is the peace that passes understanding? The peace that passes understanding means I'm at peace and there's no really reasonable reason for it. I'm just at peace. I'm in the middle of the storm, everything's falling apart around me, but I'm at peace. And that's when you have the peace that passes understanding. There's no logical, rational explanation. It's the peace that comes from God. It's not I'm at peace because of this or that or this or that. It's I'm at peace, the peace that passes understanding. There's no reason why I should be calm. There's no reason why I should not be stressed by that, but I'm not. Why? Because I didn't worry about anything, but I, I, I put my request before God, and then he says this, then fix your thoughts, that's focus, fix your thoughts on things that are true, because there's a lot of lies around, and honorable and right, and think about things, this is a mental thing, think about things that are pure and lovely and admirable, and then he says, then fill your mind, so he says, fix your thoughts, think about things, and fill your mind with thoughts that are excellent and worthy of praise. That passage, friends, gives you the four habits that'll change your life. It gives you the four habits that will give you a breakthrough. And I don't know where you need a breakthrough, but it doesn't matter to me. If you'll do these four things, you'll have a breakthrough. Now, here are the four simple uh, uh, habits. They're simple, but they're not easy to do. Here's the first one. Uh, don't worry about anything. Now, that sounds difficult, but actually, when you learn how fasting breaks worry in your life, you'll understand. Don't worry about anything. Second, he says, pray about everything. You know, if you prayed as much as you worry, 
you'd have a whole lot less to worry about. And worry doesn't change anything, but prayer does. And then he says, don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Thank God in all things. He says, in everything, give thanks. Did you know that gratitude is the breakthrough attitude? The more grateful you are, the more breakthroughs you're going to have in life. And then number four, he says, stay focused on true things. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Thank God in all things. Stay focused on true things. Every day you have to counteract the lies that you hear around you with a daily intake of God's truth. Now let's look at these four habits for breakthrough according to Philippians chapter four. Number one, first God says, don't worry about anything. You write that, write that down. Don't worry about anything. Philippians 4, 6 says that very thing. Don't worry about anything. The Amplified Translation says don't fret, don't fear, don't have any anxiety. That may be the single most difficult command in the Bible to keep. Every one of us have broken that commandment. You, maybe you haven't murdered, or maybe you haven't committed adultery, but that one's right there in the Bible along with don't lie, don't steal, don't cheat, don't murder, don't commit adultery. God says, don't worry. You break that commandment all the time. And it's in our nature to naturally worry. Jesus said it like this, Matthew 6, 34. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The reason why we mess up today is because we spend most of our emotional energy regretting the past and worrying about the future. And so we mess up today. It's like three crosses. And you can crucify yourself on guilt and shame and regret from the past, or you can crucify yourself on the cross of worry and anxiety and fear about the future, and as a result, you crucify yourself on the cross today of messing up today. Worry has never changed anything. Worry is worthless. We often, worry is a form of control. We think if we worry about our kids that then they'll be safer. Worry has no effect. It's stewing without doing. Worry is worthless. It, it, can't control, it can't change the past. It can't control the future. Worry can only mess up today. It can only make you unhappy today. Every moment, you, moment of your life you spend worrying, you're wasting that moment. Now, as I said, if you prayed as much as you worried, you'd have a whole lot less to worry about. God says, I don't want you worrying because it doesn't work. It's stewing Without doing, it's like sitting in a rocking chair. It's a lot of motion and commotion, but no forward progress. Now, what is worry? You might write this definition down. Worry is focusing on my fears instead of God. That's what it is. Worry is focusing on my fears instead of God. Worry is practical atheism. When you worry, you're acting like an orphan. You're acting like you don't have a heavenly father who's promised to care for your needs. You're acting like, if it's to be, it's up to me. That's not in the Bible, that's in self-help books. It's not true. If it's to be, it's up to God. And so, when you, act, when you worry, you're acting like your Father in heaven doesn't care about you, that he hasn't promised over 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 promises to you. So worry is focusing on my fears instead of God. And if you're going to ch break that habit of worry in your life, you're gonna have to learn how to focus on something else. Fasting can actually help you do that, and so can prayer. Now here's what the Bible says, Romans 8, verse six. Thinking that is controlled by my sinful nature leads to death, but thinking controlled by the Spirit leads to life and peace. So you have to choose your focus. If I'm gonna think the way I normally think, I'm gonna get worried, I'm gonna get fearful, I'm gonna get anxious, I'm gonna have anxiety, and because uh, I'm controlled by my sinful nature. But when I'm focused on God, and I have God's spirit in me, now I don't worry, and that leads to life and peace. So the key to overcoming worry is not to say, I'm not gonna worry, I'm not gonna worry, that doesn't work. 
That's like smoking a cigarette and go, I need to stop smoking. 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 What are you doing? The whole time you're focused on what you don't want. It's like telling a, a, a ball pitcher, don't throw a curveball. Well, now what have you just put in his mind? A curveball. He's, he's focusing on what he doesn't want instead of what he does want. And, and so do, saying, don't worry, I'm not going to worry, it keeps you focused on your worries. The key is to just change the channel. Don't resist it, refocus. That's how you get rid of worry. You don't resist worry, I'm not going to worry. You, you refocus and you put your focus on God. You do that through prayer and fasting. Now, how do I switch my focus? Write this down by fasting and prayer or by prayer and fasting. When you switch your focus by fasting, you're saying, God, I'm gonna focus on you, and when you pray, you're saying, God, I'm gonna focus on you, you don't have time to worry. Do you remember what Daniel did when he was worried? Anybody remember Daniel? And remember in chapter nine, the last message, the kingdom's falling apart, Babylon's falling apart, he's a prisoner of war there, but he's grown up now, he's an older man, and um, the, you know, the Medes and the Persians are taken over, and he's worried. But he didn't stay worried very long. Why? He did what Daniel, what David did, what Jehoshaphat did, and what Paul tells you to do. Look at this next verse, Daniel 9, verse 3. He says, I turned to the Lord. That's, I switched my focus. I turned to the Lord, and I pleaded with him in prayer and fasting. That's how you stop worry. You get the focus off the problem, and you get the focus on God. You know that when Daniel was there praying, and then the king, uh, Cyrus, said some of the Jews can go back, and he started letting them go back home. Remember, they had been promised that after 70 years, God said, I'm going to let you go back home. One of the guys who helped lead the Jews back to Israel was a guy named Ezra. He wrote a book in the Bible. It's called Ezra. And in Ezra 8, verse 23, they were all worried as they're going back home after 70 years. And it says this, we fasted and earnestly prayed that our God would take care of us and he heard our prayer. I want you to circle the word our. He heard our prayer. Not my prayer, he said our prayer. They're praying together. There is power in group prayer. There is power in seeking God together. There is power in a church praying together, church-wide, or fasting church-wide. Um, the Bible says this in Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1. There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. And, and it says there's a right time to do everything. And there is a time to feast, and there is a time to fast. Joel chapter 1, look at on the screen here, verse 14. Schedule a time to fast. Well, we did. It's going to be Monday. Call for an assembly. In other words, gather everyone together and cry out to the Lord for help. There is power in group prayer. Now that's the first habit. Worry about nothing. Don't worry about anything. Here's the second habit. Write this down. Pray about everything. Pray about everything. There's nothing too small to pray about. There's nothing too big to pray about. If it's worth worrying about, it's worth praying about. Philippians 4, 6, part B. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. And just tell God what you need. Now, look at this next verse. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Give all your worries and cares to God, uh, for he cares about what happens to you. Now, what is that verse saying? Either you can carry all your worries or you can let God carry them. It's up to you. If you want to carry all your worries, you can live under the stress. God says, why are you carrying those worries? I'd happily carry them for you. Let me carry your worries. Let me carry your cares. Let me carry your anxieties because I care for you. 